Uh, let me first say that I enjoyed a lot uh, reading your book and I'm very happy to hold this interview. I've noted some questions motivated by uh, my research um, interests. So, um, first, uh, in, in general, regarding uh, French society today, would you say that the situation of poverty, of a large poor class of uh, immigrant origin, has been a, a major feature of uh, the inequality in French society in recent decades. And if so, do you think that uh, paying attention to the structure of inequality within the bottom 90 sites might, um, of income in the West, mm -hmm. uh, might help better describe this situation? Of course, the, the main problem in inequality in France and in Europe right now is unemployment, of course. So the level of unemployment among the, the young generation is extremely high. So when you have, you know, 25%, sometimes 30, 40% of the young generation uh, who are unemployed uh, among the young, and, and that's particularly concentrated, of course, in the lower skill groups and partly in the immigrant or second generation immigrants population, but it's broader, of course, it's a general... Uh, generally speaking, the, the unemployment is extremely high among the young generation. This has catastrophic consequences for the entire society, and, and this has long-term consequences, because when you have uh, such a big fraction of the young generation who start their life without any professional experience, you know, this has major long-run uh, consequences. So this is, a, this is really a catastrophe. And the worst part is that this is entirely our fault, because you know, the unemployment rate in, in the Eurozone was the same as in the US five years ago. Public debt was the same. And then, today, five years later, unemployment has been reduced in the US and has increased enormously in the Eurozone. So why is it so? Because we've taken the wrong decision. There's been too much austerity, too little growth, too much unemployment. You know, we have managed to transform a financial crisis which initially came from the private banking sector in North America into a public debt crisis in the Eurozone. Also, initially, we didn't have more public debt in the Eurozone than in the US, or Britain, or Japan. So it's just because of our bad institutions, our bad decision-making process. You know, we are afraid of uh, making democratic decision-making and majority decision-making in the Eurozone. So we replace this by automatic rules and the level of deficit, uh, which cannot be uh, efficient because you know you cannot decide in advance regardless of the recession regardless of the growth performance how fast you want to reduce your deficit that doesn't work that will never work and so th this has consequences today particularly for the young generation which uh, which are uh, you know, a, a major major problem so so that's, that's certainly the key inequality problem in in Europe right now is is this and on this, um, on this problem of, um, of young unemployment, the, the book presents uh, the French minimum wage as a redistribution instrument in French society, especially in the period between 1968 and uh, 1983. Yet, uh, um, it seems to me that uh, this is a very special instrument that works as much to improve or keep constant the income of certain social categories as to exclude uh, poorer categories from the labor market. Uh, could you explain why you consider the minimum wage as an instrument mm. to reduce social inequality in France? Okay, so let, let me make clear that this is one of many instruments. And if you only use one instrument, then you always make mistakes. And so generally speaking, the, the, you know, this is a book about the history of inequality and the distribution of income and wealth across three centuries, over 20 countries. So my main objective is to understand the evolution and try to draw conclusions for the future, for the best possible institutions and policy. And let me make very clear that, of course, it's a whole set of policies that are important. You know, if you only uh, increase the minimum wage, uh, you know, at some point, of course, you're going to have a problem. So the main policy is to, to reduce inequality in the long run and to make broad groups of society benefit from market forces and globalization, which I believe in, are uh, education policy, labor market policy, including minimum wage, um, uh, and of course, in order to finance good education policy, good social uh, 
uh, institutions, you need taxation, and the tax system needs to be fair, and I think needs to be progressive with respect to income and wealth. So, you know, uh, uh, education, minimum wage, taxation, they are, these are all useful policy. We should not try to choose one rather than the other. So, you know, if you just increase the minimum wage uh, again and again without investing in education, you know, people will not be able to access to the kind of high skill and high productivity jobs that are consistent with the high minimum wage and people will just lose their job and as you said, some people will be excluded from the labor market. So it's all a question of proportion. What we see in recent decades is that countries, you know, the France or the US have had national minimum wage for a long time. But even countries like Britain and Germany, which didn't have national minimum wage until recently, have introduced national minimum wage. So that's an interesting development. So minimum wage probably are playing a bigger role today than they used to, partially because of the decline of unions. So certainly in Germany and, and Britain, one reason why they introduced national minimum wage, which they didn't have historically, is that unions in the services are less strong, and so they are, they are playing less their role in terms of setting a collective uh, wage bargaining and salary scales and the role they were playing uh, at the time of a uh, bigger fraction of employment this was in manufacturing and where the unions were stronger. Now does this mean we can replace union with the uh, minimum wage? Certainly not. Uh, you know, we need some of, uh, the, some of everything. So uh, in the case of France, specifically 1968-1983, uh, let me make very clear, and I think I make this very clear in the book, that the rise in the minimum wage probably was excessive in the sense that at the end of the day, you know, it, the new government elected in 1981 would have liked to pursue this forever, but in 1993 they have to freeze wages because between 1968 and 1983 you, you have a 130 or 140% increase in the purchasing value of the minimum wage, whereas per capita GDP increases by 30 or 40%. So you cannot have the minimum wage increase three times faster than uh, productivity uh, forever. You know, you can do it a little bit because there was a, a gap in the previous decade, so in the 50s, 60s, the, the bottom wages and the minimum wage were lagging behind average productivity growth. So there was, some, but uh, you cannot do that for, forever. So it's a, yeah, you you we have to look at all these policy tools in a, in a very uh, balanced uh, manner. Still on the on the domestic um, on domestic politics. Um, the book defines um, the capitalist as uh, the owner of um, capital, which is a, a legal uh, definition. But one could also think of all the forms of capital control. Uh, the employees of the company mm. might uh, can strike, and by that means exists a pressure on the owner. The inhabitants of a capital-rich uh, country, uh, by the vote or the collective actions, might um, precise the laws according to which the capital is going to be used and going to be owned. In mm -hmm. fact, so uh, would you take? Would you like to take into account so this more diffuse mm. uh, forms of capital control in your research on the dynamics of capitalism? Oh yes, that's a very important part of the history uh, of capital that I'm trying to tell in the book. So the, you know, I, I really try in the book to write a multi-dimensional history of capital ownership. So. You have different types of assets, you know, the history of agricultural land, the business assets, the real estate, the public debt uh, are not the same. And, and, and there are different ways to organize property. So, for instance, in the, in the book, I guess in uh, chapter 5, I, I, you know, I compare the, the, the stock market capitalization of German companies with Anglo-Saxon companies uh, as compared to their book value. And, and, and one thing uh, in Germany is that the market value, stock market value of, of company is, is much less than the book value, probably because this corresponds to a more stakeholder model of German capitalism, where you share power between shareholders and, and workers, and sometimes representative of regional government. And, and this is certainly not bad for economic efficiency. If anything, you know, this certainly does not prevent uh, uh, German firms from producing good cars, and, and if anything, this seems to be good for economic efficiency. So, it's very important to distinguish the market value of capital with the social value. And the social value of capital is not the same as the market value. Sometimes it can be, it can be higher. And so I, I really try in the, in the book to, to differentiate between these different aspects of capital, these different valorization of capital. And the market capitalization, the market valorization are not the only one because there are other ways to govern ownership. 
and, and more generally, um, uh, you know, in different sectors, you know, new forms of ownership will, will uh, develop in the, in the future, you know, with uh, crowdfunding and more participatory governance. You know, the, the idea is that the shareholder company with all power to shareholders is the only way to organize uh, property relation is completely wrong. You know, you have public ownership, strictly speaking, which is very important in some sectors for public infrastructure, for education, else if you privatize everything, that's not good. And, that, and you also have many intermediate forms of ownership between pure private and pure public with stakeholder model, with, uh, you know, in the university sector, in the health sector, you know, nobody has ever proposed to transform uh, Harvard University into a shareholder company uh, uh, trading on the stock market. You know, it's a non-profit uh, Foundations. There are intermediate forms between shareholder company, non-profit uh, non foundations that can be developed uh, you know, in the media recently. So I think the, you know, it's not because the, the big attempt to collectivize property in the 20th century was a major failure that the issue of how to organize property uh, is over. And I think there are new forms of uh, uh, property relation and, and governance system uh, that um, that will have to be developed in the 21st century. And, and you know, I, I, I try in my book, you know, to offer this uh, sort of broad uh, uh, multidimensional and, and historical perspective on different kinds of ownership. Uh, on the more international uh, part of uh, inequality, um, through the inequality R is bigger than G, the, the book emphasizes that the norm is a divergence between social groups and the stabilization at a high level of, um, of inequality. Yet the book also considers uh, a convergence between rich and poor countries, which would be the, the feature of, of the current uh, period. It seems to me that first this process of convergence is uh, the process of emergence, which they are very localized and I'm not sure if we can consider that the emergence is, uh, is not so limited, in fact. But if we accept uh, this idea of a global convergence to a certain extent, is there not a contradiction here with the theories of uh, R is bigger than G and mm. its implications? And, and secondly, um, I, I, um, could you further explain why you consider that the mobility of capital uh, which you acknowledge has considerably mm -hmm. increased, is not a factor in that dynamic. Mm, that's a key factor. You're perfectly right. Uh, probably the most important factor driving inequality is this mobility of capital, because this is what makes it very difficult, of course, for national government to regulate and tax capital. So that's uh, one of the key factors. Now, although this is a key factor, and although R bigger than G is an important factor, you know, there are many other mechanisms that play a role in my historical account of inequality. So it's not... Well, you know, there, there are lots of contradictions in the, in the economic dynamics. Indeed, there are contradictory processes that are working at the same time. So, there are, as I tried to explain in the introduction, there are forces of convergence, there are forces of divergence. And in the end, which one dominates very much depends on the institutions and policies that we choose. So, there's no, I don't believe in economic uh, deterministic laws. Uh, there are powerful forces that can reduce inequality, including the, the diffusion of skills and knowledge uh, between countries, and also within countries, this can be very powerful. But there are forces that can go in the other direction, including a high gap between R and G, which can be fostered by uh, capital mobility and competition to attract capital. Now, which one will, will be stronger and, and how will uh, concentration of income and wealth change in the coming decades? I don't know. Nobody knows. And I think the, the, in the, in, at the end, the main conclusion of my book for the future is that we need more transparency about income and wealth dynamics so that we can adapt our policies to whatever we observe. I think the, 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 the best data we have so far suggests that concentration at the top of the wealth solution is rising very fast, but we don't know how far it will go. Uh, and we are not sure uh, completely of what's really going on with the distribution of wealth because of the lack of transparency, in particular about cross-border financial assets. So, so to, to me, the, the main conclusion is that we, we cannot just rely on natural forces to, to correct this process. 
and we need strong uh, democratic institution and more transparency for us to adapt our policies to, to, to this. Yeah. Uh, last question. Uh, I really liked your your description of the of the elite of the good uh, conscience, I would say, of the elites of the third republic. Mm -hmm. so, um, do um, do you think that we could consider that there is some kind of good conscience in other instances and for instance in the relation between Western countries and today and for instance the poor Arab world? I, I would say that is, um, I have the feeling when listening to public debate that there is this democracy in the West and and in those poor countries we are just wondering if they can support democracy that debate about the compatibility between Islam and democracy at a time when some form of political Islam mm -hmm. has become a way of expression of the hatred of the dominated mm -hmm. against the dominating. I, I, it seems to me that here we can find some kinds of uh, rhetorical and discursive mm -hmm. processes similar to the one you described. Would you agree? On I, I, I agree that there's often a lot of hypocrisy you know, in, the, in the way the elite uh, tries to justify inequality, um, trying to pretend that this is in the common interest. So there's a lot of hypocrisy certainly in the domestic uh, political debate, you, know, you see the example of the French Republican elite in 1914, or the American elite today, you know, keep pretending that extreme inequality is in the interest of the poor, you know, even though it's not so convincing. Now there's sometimes even more hypocrisy, you're right, at the international level, you know, we, we like, you know, Western countries like to, to give lessons of uh, democracy and social justice to everyone, and, and you know, in particular, uh, East, but uh, you know the behavior of Western countries with respect to inequality in the Middle East uh, does not make uh, you know the Western uh, discourse uh, very credible because you know in the past you know first what Western countries have done is to draw boundaries in the Middle East so as to put oil in very particular places you know places with no population basically and the idea of the West historically was uh, well it's going to be easier to deal with government without population. Then, when there was some uh, some attempt to redistribute oil, uh, like uh, the Iraq-Kuwait war, you know, the West sent the troops to give back the oil to the Emir of Kuwait. Um, uh, and then, you know, this is an area of the world, this is probably the area of the world with the highest degree of inequality. At some point in the book, I compare the, the schools and education system in Egypt with the oil revenues of the Emirates. So, you know, Egypt is a country with almost 100 million people. And the total budget going to its entire school system is 100 times smaller than the oil revenue coming to going to countries without population uh, a few hundred kilometers away. So this is a form of inequality that is so extreme. And then, the, the, you know, without the military protection of the West, this would have ended a long time ago. You know, through revolution, through war, through you know, more pacific agreement, but this would have ended because this is just too extreme. This is just too much. And then instead of that, you know, what the West have been doing is to keep this going, basically. So, so then, then you know, so you, we always have lessons about democracy, justice, but, uh, you know, it's not too surprising if the youth uh, and the young generation in, uh, in Cairo or, or Baghdad, you know, do not listen to, to us too much. Okay, I, I thank you very much for having uh, to reply to, to, my, to my question. Thank you.